Hello, and thank you for joining me in Annie Stories. In today's video, I'll be reading William Hoff's fairy tale called Fatima's Rescue. I think you will enjoy this exciting and adventurous story as much as I did. So, without further ado, let us begin. Fatima's Rescue. The Cadi of Akara had two children named Mustafa and Fatima. Who were the joy and delight of their infirmed and ailing father, and who loved each other very dearly. Mustafa was just two years older than Fatima, and it was his constant effort to provide pleasure and amusement for his pretty little sister. On her sixteenth birthday, he gave a little feast for her, to which he invited all her favorite playfellows. The feast was set out in the garden. And consisted of the daintiest dishes that could be procured. After they had partaken of the meal, and when it was nearly evening, he suggested that he should take them out for a sail upon the water. Fatima and her friends were delighted, for it was a beautiful evening, and the view of the town from the water was a particularly fine one. When Mustafa had sailed the ship for a short time. He wished to return to land, but the girls begged and entreated him to take them a little further out. He was most unwilling to do this, as he knew a pirate ship had been seen in the neighborhood some few days earlier. The girls, however, were set on sailing out to the point of land that stretched far out into the sea, for they were anxious to land there in order to watch the sun set and see the great ball of fire. Sink down into the sea. Just as they reached the point of land, they noticed a bark manned with armed men, and Mustafa, fearing it might mean danger, ordered the boat to be turned round and rowed towards land. But the bark pursued the smaller boat, overtook it, and got between it and the land. By this time, the girls began to realize their danger. And so terrified were they that they shrieked aloud, and would not keep their seats in the boat. In vain, Mustafa begged them to sit still, pointing how impossible it was to make any way whilst they impeded the movements of the rowers. As the bark approached, with one accord they rushed to the opposite side of the boat, and their weight overturned it, and in a moment they were all struggling in the water. The people on shore had seen what was happening, and several boats put off to assist Mustafa. They were just in time to help rescue the frightened girls, and at their approach, the strange bark sailed away. At first, it was impossible to find out if everyone was safe, but when the girls were brought ashore, it was discovered, alas, that Fatima and one of her companions were missing. In one of the boats was a stranger, and on Mustafa questioning him as to how he got there, he owned that he had belonged to the pirate ship, that he had jumped overboard to come to the assistance of the sinking girls, and that his comrades had left him in the lurch when they fled from the approaching boats. But he had had time to see that two of the girls had been seized by the pirates and carried away in their ship. The Kadi's grief knew no bounds, and as for Mustafa, he was beside himself with sorrow, for not only did he blame himself for the loss of his beloved sister, but her friend, who had also been taken captive, had been for a long time past his promised bride, and would have been his wife already, had it not been that her parents were poor, and the Kadi did not think her a suitable match for his son. Mustafa's father was a stern old man, and as soon as his grief had sufficiently subsided, he sent for his son and said, "Owing to your folly, I have been robbed of the joy and consolation of my old age. Go, I banish you from my sight for ever, and the curse of your old father shall rest upon your head, unless by some chance you should be able to rescue Fatima, when I will forgive you." And receive you once more as my son. 
Mustafa had already fully determined to endeavor to rescue his sister and her friend, but he had intended to seek his father's blessing before setting out upon his travels. However, the unjust treatment he received did but steal his heart and made him the more determined not to cease upon his quest until he had been successful. He spoke to the man they had captured from the pirate ship, and from him learned that the vessel was a slaver, and that the human wares were generally carried to Balsora, and there disposed of. Mustafa decided to travel over land, as there happened to be no ship sailing just then from his native town, and he wished to reach Balsora soon after the pirates. He had a good horse and little baggage, so he reckoned he could do the journey in six days' time. But alas, upon the evening of the fourth day, he was set upon quite suddenly by three men. Seeing that resistance was useless, and supposing the attacking party merely wanted his horse and money, he decided to surrender, which he did. The men then dismounted, and taking him in their midst, rode off with him in great speed. It seemed to the poor youth that his father's curse was already about to light upon him, for he could not think how it would be possible for him to rescue Fatima and Zoraida, deprived, as he shortly expected to be, of all means. He and his companions rode silently along for about an hour. They then turned into a valley, skirted by gigantic trees and carpeted with soft green turf. A brook gurgled peacefully through the valley, and beside it some fifteen to twenty tents were pitched, whilst a number of camels and horses were tethered to the tent pegs. The sound of a zither, accompanying two fine manly voices, issued from one of the tents. It seemed very improbable that people who had selected such a charming little spot for their camping place could have very evil intentions. And so Mustafa took heart and followed his guides quite cheerfully when, having unbound his feet and bidden him dismount, they led him into a tent larger and more richly decorated than any of the others. The beautiful cushions, embroidered with gold, woven carpets and golden dishes, in which sweet perfumes burnt, would elsewhere merely have betokened wealth and luxury. But in these lonely surroundings seemed to point to robbery. On one of the cushions sat a little old man. His face was ugly, swarthy, and repulsive. A gleam of savage cunning in his eyes, and a cruel look about his mouth, gave him a hateful appearance. Although he seemed to be a person of some importance, Mustafa soon perceived that the tent had not been so richly decorated on his account, and his captor's words confirmed this. Where is the chief? they asked the little man. Away hunting, he replied, but he told me to take his place during his absence. More the pity, replied one of the brigands, for we must soon decide whether this dog is to die, or whether we are to obtain a ransom for him. And that is a question for the chief to decide, and not for you to meddle with. The little man raised himself in wrath, and attempted to box the ears of the man who had annoyed him by this speech. But as he could not reach to do this, he burst into a perfect valley of abuse, and as the other brigands were not slow to reply, the tent soon resounded with tones of angry voices. But the curtains of the entrance to the tent were suddenly lifted, and in came a tall, handsome young man, stately and dignified as a Persian prince. His clothing and weapons were plain and unadorned, with the exception of a dagger with a richly decorated hilt and a gleaming saber. His determined mien and his whole appearance were such as commanded respect without inspiring terror. Who dares to quarrel in my tent? He demanded of the startled men. For a moment there was silence, and then one of the brigands recounted all that had happened. 
the chief's face reddened with anger. When have I ever set you in my place, Hassan? he cried. And the little man seemed to shrink with fear, until he looked smaller than ever. He got up and began to slink out of the tent, when a good kick from the chief sent him flying out of the doorway. As soon as the little man had disappeared, the three men placed Mustafa before the master of the tent, who had seated himself upon the cushions. We have brought you the man you bade us bring, said they. The chief gazed earnestly at the prisoner and said, Pasha of Suli'ika, your own conscience will tell you why you are in the presence of Orbasan. On hearing these words, Mustafa flung himself at Orbasan's feet. You are in error, my lord, he said. I am an unfortunate traveler, but not the Pasha of Suli'ika. The brigands, the brigands appeared to be surprised, but the chief said, Dissimulation will not help you. I can bring witness to prove your identity. And he thereupon commanded one Sulima should be brought in. An old woman appeared, and on being questioned as to whether or not the man before her was the Pasha of Suli'ika, she answered immediately that he was. Wretched man! cried the chief angrily. You see how impossible it is to deceive me. You are not worthy that I should stain my good dagger with your blood, but tomorrow morning I will have you bound to the tail of my horse and will go a-hunting with you till the sun sets behind the hills of Suli'ika. Mustafa's heart sank. It is my father's curse that has driven me to this shameful death, he cried. Alas! Sweet sister and Zoraida, how can I ever hope to rescue you now? This pretense is useless, said one of the brigands. See, the chief bites his lips and feels for his dagger. If you wish to live another night, you had best come with me quickly. And binding Mustafa's hands behind his back, he was about to lead him from the tent when three other brigands entered with a prisoner in their midst. Here, as you commanded us, we bring you the Pasha of Suli'ika, said one of them, leading their prisoner before the chief. Mustafa glanced at the prisoner and could not but own that there was a great resemblance between himself and the Pasha. Only, the man was darker in complexion and wore a dark beard. The chief was much surprised to see a second prisoner. Which of you is really the man I seek? he asked. If you seek the Pasha of Suli'ika, the prisoner answered proudly, I am he. The chief regarded him with a stern and terrible look, and then made signs that he was to be led away. This being done, he cut the cords that bound Mustafa with his dagger, and invited him to take a seat by his side. I ask your pardon for the mistake that has occurred, he said but it was a strange interposition of providence that placed you in the hands of my companions at the moment they were lying in wait for that vile wretch you have just seen. Musafa asked for one favor only as compensation, namely, that he might be allowed to proceed on his way without further delay, and on the chief questioning him as to the reason of his great haste, he told him all. The chief then persuaded him to remain with him one night at least, telling him that both he and his horse needed rest, and promised to show him the next morning a short way by which he would be able to reach Balsara in a day and a half. Mustafa agreed to this, and after being most hospitably entertained, slept soundly all night long in the robber's tent. When he woke, he found himself alone in the tent, but through the hangings over the doorway, he could hear voices, which seemed to belong to the robber chief and the little dark dwarf. He listened attentively, and to his horror, heard the little man advising the chief to murder him, as if he were allowed to go free, he might betray the whole troop. Mustafa could not but perceive that the little man owed him a grudge, because he had been the cause of the sharp treatment he had received the previous day. But the robber chief, 
after reflecting a few moments, said, No, he is my guest, and as such, is sacred to me, besides which, he does not look like a man to betray one. He then thrust aside the tent curtains and entered. Peace be with thee, Mustafa, he said. We will drain a morning draught, and then you should prepare yourself to start. He handed his guest a cup of sherbet, and when they had each drunk, they saddled their horses, and Mustafa mounted and left the camp with a lighter heart than when he had entered it. As they left the tents behind them, the chief told his new friend that the pasha they had captured the previous day, after having promised him and his men the free range of his territory, had captured one of the best and bravest of them, and after torturing him terribly, had hanged him, and that now he should die himself. Mustafa did not venture to remonstrate, being only too glad to escape with a whole skin himself. When they reached the limit of the forest, the chief drew rein and offered his hand to Mustafa in farewell. Mustafa, said he, you have been in somewhat a strange fashion the guest of the robber Orbasan. I will not ask you not to betray me, but trust to you that you will not do so. You have suffered without cause all the pangs of the fear of death, and you deserve some compensation. Take this dagger, and if ever you are in need of help, send it to me, and I will hasten to your aid. This purse of gold may also be of assistance to you on your journey. Mustafa thanked him for his generosity, accepted the dagger, but refused the purse. But Orbasan, having pressed his hand, let the purse fall to the ground, and then set spurs to his horse, and rode off at such speed that Mustafa, seeing it was useless to overtake him, picked up the purse, and was astonished to find what a quantity of money it contained. Having thanked Allah for his goodness, and recommended the robber to his protection, he continued his journey in a much more cheerful mood towards Balsora. He reached that city on the seventh day of his journey, and as soon as he had put up at an inn, he inquired when the next yearly slave market was to be held. To his horror and distress, he heard that he had arrived just two days too late for it. The people sympathized with him over his delay, and told him how much he had lost, for on the very last day of the market, two young slaves had been put up for sale who were so beautiful that there had been great bidding amongst the people for them and they fetched such a high price that only their present master, who was a very rich man, could afford to buy them. On making further inquiries as to their appearance, he could no longer doubt they were the two unfortunate girls he was in search of. He also heard that the man who had bought them was called Thulikos, and lived forty miles away from Balsara. He was an elderly man who had amassed a large fortune and had retired from public affairs and settled down to enjoy his possessions in peace and quietness. At first Mustafa thought he would remount and try and overtake Thulikos, but then he reflected that he could do little, for he was but a single man against a large retinue Thulikos would no doubt have with him, and that it would be impossible to wrest his prey from him. He therefore thought of another plan. His resemblance to the Pasha of Suleika, which well nigh proved fatal to him, might stand him in good stead now, and he determined to enter Thulikos's house in that name, in order to attempt the rescue of the two girls. He therefore engaged servants and horses, and here Orbasan's gift of money assisted him. Having purchased magnificent clothing for himself and his servants, he set out for Thulikos's palace. He reached it in five days, and found it was built on a lovely plain, and so, surrounded by high walls, that few of the buildings could be seen from without. He took the precaution to dye his hair and beard a darker tint, and colored his face with the juice of a certain plant he knew of, so that no one could ever suppose he was any other than the real Pasha. 
Then he sent one of his servants to Thuli's palace to ask for a night's lodging. The servant returned accompanied by four beautifully dressed slaves, who led Mustafa's horse into the courtyard. They assisted him to alight and led him up a flight of marble steps to Thuli. Thuli was a jolly old fellow and received Mustafa kindly, and ordered the best dishes his cook could prepare to be set before him. After dinner, Mustafa turned the conversation to slaves, and the old man told him of the two beauties he had just lately bought, praising their appearance loudly, but regretting the fact that they appeared to be so sad, so that Mustafa retired to bed in high hopes of being soon able to effect a rescue. He had been asleep about an hour when he was awakened by the light of a lamp streaming down upon his eyes. Raising himself on his elbow, he at first believed himself to still be sleeping and dreaming, for before him stood the same swarthy little dwarf he had seen in Orbison's tent. He carried a lamp in his hand, and a horrid grin distended his mouth from ear to ear. "'What do you want?' asked Mustafa angrily, as soon as he had convinced himself he was awake. "'Don't disturb yourself,' replied the little man. I know quite well why you are here. Your noble countenance is not unknown to me. Had I not assisted in the hanging of the Pasha of Suleika, I might have mistaken you for him. But I am here to make a suggestion. First of all, tell me why you are here, said Mustafa. Well, replied the little man, I did not get on very well with the chief, and so I left him. Our last particular quarrel was over you, and so, Mustafa, it is but fair you should promise me your sister for a wife, otherwise I will go straight to my new master and tell him who the Pasha of Suleika really is.